There's nothing quite like a Land Rover Discovery, and this improved fourth generation version continues to offer the toughest, the most practical, and the most capable choice in the large SUV sector. Recent changes have added extra high tech equipment, a whole raft of subtle cosmetic updates, and a greater emphasis on improved efficiency and lower emissions. The result is an even more compelling multi purpose proposition. Without this Discovery model, it's doubtful whether the Land Rover brand would even exist today. Launched back in 1989, the original version merely bolted more spacious bodywork onto an aging Range Rover chassis, but the sales it generated were enough to save the company. They also financed a more sophisticated five-cylinder air-suspended model in 1998, at the same time as the company's engineers were busily beavering away at something much better the design that's ultimately become the improved fourth generation version that we're looking at here. This car traces its parentage back to the third generation Discovery 3 of 2004, a design vastly superior to anything that had gone before. Until that point, family SUVs had either been very good off-road or very good on it. Thanks to its double chassis and air suspended integrated body frame technology, this car could be both and customers loved it. Sadly, there was less sophistication beneath the bonnet, and in terms of the variance on offer, customers ended up having to choose between thirsty or slow. Hence the need for the fourth generation Discovery 4 model we first saw in 2009. That car at last had a properly performing diesel engine, a 3 litre TDV6 unit quickly further refined and rebadged as an SDV6 power plant but its heavy underpinnings put it at a disadvantage to more modern German rivals. Some of these Land Rover was able to take on with the second generation Range Rover Sport model launched in mid 2013, but lower order Mercedes, BMW and Audi SUVs all still needed a competitive discovery model to keep them honest, and this is it. Launched in the autumn of 2013, it's now known merely as the Discovery and offers greater efficiency, higher tech equipment and slightly smarter looks. Let's put it to the test. There's still something very special about a place behind the wheel of a Discovery. The characteristically high driving position giving you a great view out over the vast square bonnet. In contrast to more car-like rivals, it's not a cockpit like experience with all the controls angled towards you as they would be in say a Range Rover Sport. No, this is different, a place of command, a place to do business with the elements, be they the snake infested swamps of the rainy season in the Serengeti or the snarled up traffic of a wet windy morning on the school run. View the car from this perspective and you're less likely to wonder why you can't throw it around with abandon and more likely to simply settle back and enjoy the classless way it cruises through the urban landscape. It's around 500 kilograms heavier than its most obvious German rivals, thanks to the integrated body frame double chassis underpinnings, which is an awful lot more bulk to carry around. Having said that, the standard air suspension still manages the car's mass and height with impressive precision. Yes, it wallows a little through the corners if you're really pushing on and ultimately the limiting factor is grip, but it's fine for its intended market without ever feeling sporty enough to impinge on Range Rover territory. So most of the time you'll drive this Discovery at a saunter, though having said that the torquey 256 brake horsepower 3 litre SDV6 diesel is always ready to break into a run, accompanied by a rather wonderful snarl at the same time as you move smoothly up and down the standard ZF Auto Gearbox's 8 ratios. That's assuming that you're not taking control yourself via these steering wheel mounted shift paddles. Land Rover claims shift times of just 200 milliseconds, which in conjunction with the boast that the 3 litre diesel delivers 600 newton metres of torque in only 500 milliseconds from idle, uh, thus giving instantaneous access to 95% of the engine's maximum torque, that all perhaps explains why the disco feels so unfeasibly lively off the mark. To be specific, 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 9.2 seconds on the way to 112 miles an hour. 
I can't for the life of me see why you'd ever want to drive this car more quickly than that. More importantly, pulling power is sufficient for Land Rover to quote a mighty 3,500 kilogram braked towing limit. It's 750 kilograms unbraked. Better still, the air suspended ride is brilliant. The brakes are excellent, the steering accurate, and refinement is quite astonishingly good given the boxy shape. All of this is especially impressive in light of the fact that, thankfully, Land Rover has refused to compromise on this car's legendary off-road ability. Or at least it hasn't for the UK market. Elsewhere, base versions of this car are offered with a lighter, less effective Torsen four-wheel drive setup and without a low-range gearbox, the same kind of option that you'll get on cheaper Range Rover Sport models. Solihull clearly thinks that British Discovery buyers wouldn't stand for that. So here you get a proper heavy-duty 4x4 system able to direct fully 100% of torque to either axle. And if you do find yourself somewhere really sticky, it can be locked in the optimum 50-50 front-to-rear power split ratio that will ease you out. If that sounds complicated, then don't worry. This car can automatically manage all the off-road driving decisions you'll ever have to make via a very clever little switch panel down here at the bottom of the centre console. This the company's patented and now further improved terrain response system. Now this is virtually akin to having an expert sitting alongside you, helping to get the best out of the vehicle on or off-road. As a driver, you simply choose one of the five terrain settings provided by the panel's top rocker switch. There's a general tarmac driving program, plus one for slippery conditions that's dubbed grass, gravel, snow, and three specialist off-road modes, mud and ruts, sand, and rock crawl. There's also the option of a launch control function designed for deep sand and in more recent times tweaks have been made to the uh, hill descent control and the rock crawl mode to ensure that uh, tricky maneuvers are made that little bit easier. What it all means is that you've simply to make your selection, tune up Radio 4 and watch the worst that the elements can throw at you glide past the window. It's brilliant. Now you probably won't care how the Discovery manages all of this, but those who do will be interested to know that a lot of this capability is down to class leading wheel travel and articulation. And the way that the air suspension can increase the standard 185mm ride height to as much as 310mm over really rocky surfaces. The option to set the car riding that high is also an obvious advantage in water. It accounts for the enormous 700 mm wading capability that you can monitor via an optional wade sensing feature that uh, shows you the depth of the water that you're driving through. A visual display and warning chimes uh, alert the driver as the water level rises around the vehicle. And while we're talking about how high this car can get off the ground, we should also mention how that facilitates an impressive approach angle of 37.2 degrees that'll get you up steep slopes. And once you've used the standard hill descent control to ease you down them again, you'll be glad of a useful departure angle of 29.6 degrees. For me, a Land Rover product should be head and shoulders above all other SUVs when it comes to off-road access, which is where this car really delivers. You'd have to be quite a Land Rover enthusiast to spot the visual changes that differentiate this updated discovery from the original version of the fourth generation model. That's probably as it should be. The Discovery has its own timeless roadway presence that the Solihull stylists mess with at their peril. So the huge slab-like bonnet, the stepped roof, and the wrap effect that characterizes the rear side windows, all these things are present and correct. The bluff nose too, which is where you'll find one of the major differences in the way that this car in future is to be marketed. For the first time in this model's history, the spaced out lettering here uh, no longer says Land Rover, but Discovery. 
Discovery, it seems, is to become a Land Rover sub-brand, just as Range Rover is. We'll see the full outworking of that plan in the next generation version of this car, but for the time being, this one has received a few well-chosen visual tweaks to keep it looking fresh. So there are smarter headlamps, uh, a glossier radiator grille and fog light surrounds, uh, restyled bumpers and more rounded door mirrors. Nothing too major then, but of course the important changes to this car were made some time ago. In 2004 to be exact, when in the design's progression from second to third generation status, 17.6 centimetres were added to the body length. This turned it from a cramped five-seater with two occasional extra berths to a proper seven-seat SUV unrivaled in its segment for space and comfort. Now, I'm not pretending these fold-away rearmost seats, they're fairly straightforward to erect, are where I'd want to be on a very long trip, but they certainly provide more space than you'd get on the optional fold-out chairs offered in, say, a BMW X5 or a Range Rover Sport. And they're roomier than the standard third row seating you get in an Audi Q7. Two adults will be fine on shorter trips and a couple of kids will be happy here, well, just about any time. Things would be even better at the very back if this middle row bench could slide back and forth so that shorter folk here could help out longer legged occupants like me behind. Unfortunately, that's not possible, but then to be fair, that's a rare feature in this market segment. What's important though is the overall flexibility of this middle seating arrangement. It's split into three separate thirds. And the key is that once you are installed here in the middle, then there's comfortable room for two adults and maybe even three on shorter journeys, providing that the center occupant doesn't mind uh, sitting with their legs astride a slightly raised center transmission tunnel. And at the wheel, well, how far you climb up into the commanding seat will depend on whether you set the air suspension to its easy access mode, which lowers the car by 50 millimeters to make getting in a touch easier. Once you're in, you'll find a cabin that's a bit like the outside, less sporty and sophisticated, and more durable and commanding, which is not to imply that it isn't very nice indeed. True, the speedometer's a little hard to read without numbering in 10 mile an hour increments, and the infotainment touchscreen that on all but base trim models dominates the center of the dash is a little cluttered and complicated to use until you get used to it. Having said all of that, the cabin quality is certainly a good few notches nicer than it used to be with stitched leather and soft touch plastics much in evidence. And there are lovely touches like the rotary chromed Jaguar style gear lever that rises elegantly out of the fascia on startup, just in front of the terrain response panel that takes pride of place at the base of the center console. The cargo bay is accessed via a neat asymmetrically split two-piece aluminium tailgate. So in true Range Rover style, you can use it as a picnic seat or a viewing platform. Plus there's the added advantage that you need only raise the top part if you're putting in small items. If you're accessing the whole luggage area, there's 280 litres if all three seating rows are in place, 1,192 litres if the third row seats are folded, and a class leading 2,558 litres if both second and third rows are flat. Expect to pay somewhere in the 40 to 60,000 pound bracket for your discovery. Follow the path chosen by most buyers in buying a mid-spec model, then adding a few well-chosen extras, and you'll need a £50,000 budget, just about the level that Range Rover Sport pricing begins from. There's just one single seven-seat Discovery body style option and a single SDV6 diesel power plant. Britain doesn't get the lower power uh, TDV6 diesel or the 3 litre supercharged petrol engines available in other markets. 
So, how does that stack up against the opposition? Well, essentially, there are two levels of discovery ownership these days. The entry-level GS model is there to compete with less sporty, non-German large SUVs that congregate at just under the £40,000 price point. Cars like Volvo's XC90, Toyota's Land Cruiser 3.0-litre D4D, and maybe a top version of Mitsubishi Shogun all spring to mind. But all of these rivals offer quite a lot less power. The only one that can match this Land Rover in that respect is Jeep's Grand Cherokee model in 3 litre CRD V6 247 brake horsepower guise. But that car offers significantly lower residual values than a Discovery. As I was saying earlier though, most disco owners assign a 45 to 50,000 pound budget to their purchase so that they can opt for a mid-range XS variant. And that's the kind of money that then takes this car into contention with sportier, premium badged German SUVs like the Mercedes M-Class, the BMW X5, the Audi Q7, the Volkswagen Touareg, maybe also the Porsche Cayenne diesel. Now, all of these cars are much lighter than a Discovery, which means that you can choose an entry-level version of the Merc, the BMW, the Audi, and the Volkswagen with around 200 brake horsepower and still match the performance of this SDV6 at 256 brake horsepower Land Rover. And that lightness also means that all these German competitors will outshine this Discovery around the twisty stuff. That's the bad news. On the plus side, well, it's horses for courses, isn't it? A Discovery isn't supposed to be a really sporty large SUV. Solihull provides the only slightly pricier Range Rover Sport to fill that role. It's more relevant to remember that no German rival can get close to this car's ultimate off-road ability, and even more importantly, no German rival approaches this car's practicality. Of the cars I've just mentioned, only the BMW and the Audi can even be ordered with seven seats and both offer much less total carriage space for either people or packages. Ultimately, of course, it all comes down to what you want, but nobody in this marketplace seriously argues with this discovery status as the toughest, biggest and most versatile all-rounder in this segment. If, having considered all of this, you agree and have concluded that it is a discovery that you really want, then you're going to need to know what's included in the asking price. Before we get on to that, I'd point out that all models get a proper low-range gearbox, a heavy-duty four-wheel drive system, and Land Rover's acclaimed terrain response system, which enables you to set the vehicle up to precisely suit the ground that you're driving over. Now, don't take all of that for granted. This stuff is now optional or only fitted to pricier models in some other markets. UK customers don't have to worry about that and can also expect to find electronic air suspension and an eight-speed automatic gearbox with paddle shifters. And beyond that, well, it shouldn't be necessary on a capable Land Rover model to pay extra for a full-size spare wheel. And it's a pity that you have to stretch to mid-spec level to get key items like the centre dash infotainment touchscreen, cruise control and roof rails. But the base spec does otherwise include a reasonable amount. Expect that tally to include 19-inch 10-spoke alloy wheels, LED rear lights, automatic climate control, uh, Bluetooth phone compatibility, a push-button start, uh, rear parking sensors, a volumetric alarm, a heated front windscreen, and an eight-speaker audio system with DAB digital radio and both aux in and USB compatibility. Safety stuff includes eight airbags, tire pressure monitoring, DSC stability control, and a brake assist function in the ABS system to help in emergency stops. If you're towing, you'll be glad of the TSA trailer stability assist system that stops your load from swaying about. And off-road, you'll value hill start assist to get you up steep slopes, gradient acceleration control to help you crest them, and hill descent control to ease you down the other side. You can add to that safety tally, of course, by spending a little extra. This car, for example, has a vision assist pack that gives you a surround camera system and Xenon adaptive front headlamps that turn with the corners and dip themselves in the face of oncoming traffic. It also has an exterior detection pack that gives you a blind spot monitor to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another driver. Plus, closing vehicle sensing for greater awareness of other vehicles on the highway. 
This pack also includes reverse traffic detection to warn you of rapidly approaching vehicles when you're reversing out of a parking space. And wade sensing, so that if you're fording water, you know exactly how deep it is. Serious off-roaders will be interested in that last feature, and these are the kind of people likely to also want to find the extra for the rear axle locking diff or even an electric winch. Most owners will want a tow bar, and many will find the sunroof with alpine roof glass roof arrangement that bays the cabin with light to be tempting. Finally, if you've anything left in the budget after all that, there are some desirable Meridian premium audio system upgrades, either an 8-speaker 380 watt setup or a thumping 17-speaker 825 watt system. I'd also want to look at the tow bar mounted 2 bike carrier and the roof rail kit. And finally, I particularly like this car's rather clever timed climate feature, standard only on top models, which preheats the cabin and engine in cold weather and works on a seven-day timer operated much like a home central heating programmer. Programming is accomplished via the audio system touchscreen or remote control. When it comes to cost of ownership, the major issue Land Rover has is the sheer weight of this car. The integrated body frame with its two separate chassis that undergirds this discovery does of course make it very effective off-road, but combined with the weight of the four-wheel drive system and the low-range gearbox also makes it very heavy by class standards at well over two and a half tonnes. Obviously the bluff boxy shape doesn't help much either. Now there's only so much that Land Rover engineers can do to offset this, but clearly a start-stop system would help one of those that cuts the engine when not in use in traffic or at the lights. It's taken quite a time for Solihull to get around to adding one of these to a Discovery, but now that it has, it's made quite a difference. CO2 returns improving to 213 grams per kilometre and fuel consumption improving to 35.3 uh, miles to the gallon on the combined cycle. Now, while that doesn't do anything for benefiting kind tax, it does at least move the car into a slightly lower annual road tax bracket. Overall though, you'd be lucky to get much more than about 28 miles out of every gallon on a regular basis from this car. So, if you're in the business of making comparisons, how does that leave this discovery looking in its market? The answer is that when it comes to running costs, you should think in terms of this Land Rover setting you back about 5% more to run than an Audi Q7, Volkswagen Touareg or Jeep Grand Cherokee, about 10% more than a comparable Mercedes M-Class or Porsche Cayenne diesel, and about 20% more than a comparable BMW X5. But then none of these cars are as large and practical, and none is anything like as good off-road. Find yourself a large SUV that can get close to matching this discovery in these respects, say a long wheelbase Mitsubishi Shogun or Toyota Land Cruiser, and you'll find that it's slower, less well built and costlier to run. In other words, though in comparison to some rivals, there's still a premium to pay for this car's ultimate versatility and capability. It's a smaller one these days, and with the recent efficiency improvements made, it's now pretty justifiable. The world takes on a different appearance from behind the wheel of a Land Rover Discovery. At the helm, you know you're in a car that can take on just about anything, be that a seven-up trip to the Alps or a relaxing ride home on a wet and slippery winter's night. But it's only when you put it through its paces in properly extreme terrain that the genius in its design becomes fully apparent. How can a car capable of such extremes on the rough stuff be so utterly easy to use on the school run? Only Land Rover knows. Of course, German branded SUV rivals are sportier, but then the Solihull brand has the Range Rover Sport to take them on, uh, for those who can afford it. Those who can't and want to buy British need a discovery that can stay in the same dynamic ballpark as an M-Class, a Q7 or an X5, at the same time as continuing to obliterate cars of this kind off-road. A discovery that isn't vastly more expensive to run, and one that can be ordered with all the high-tech gadgetry the Germans offer. This is that car. There's a clever, classless feel about it that nothing else can quite replicate. Other rival SUVs claim to be tough, but at the wheel you're always a little hesitant to see them prove that. 
a discovery is different, with a sheer depth of capability that's constantly tempting you into finding reasons to test it, to enjoy what it can do. Pothole tracks no longer need to be tackled at a snail's pace. The softest roadside verges become viable turning opportunities and any muddy bank cries out to be driven down and up again, just for the heck of it. In contrast, some other sportier large SUVs can feel, well, rather silly. But then this is a different way to go in this segment. A uniquely capable car of its kind and a British success story that we should be proud of.